Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you here once again to Pikeville Medical Center. I uh, certainly wish it was better circumstances, but uh, we understand, a lot of us understand the position that we're currently in right now. And uh, over the last, especially few days, several members of the media has reached out and our intent is to always be as transparent as possible. So today we're gonna share some, uh, some vital statistics, some data, some information in hopes that the public will understand the severity and what we are facing in this crisis. This is extremely serious and we really need for people to pay attention. So I don't wanna uh, dwell on just remedial facts. We wanna do what we've always done and present uh, data and to present numbers that will uh, validate the position that we're currently in. So before that we go through our slides, you know, one of the things that we're very, very proud of as part of this community is the number of folks that all come, always come together and support one another in time of need or in time, in this case, in crisis. One such partner has been the Pike County Health Department. And Tammy, we appreciate our partnership and all that you are doing and your staff is doing uh, to combat this, this serious, serious pandemic. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Tammy Riley to come up and to share some information on their behalf. After Tammy comes up, then I'll come back and share some slides. And then I'll uh, ask either Dr. Fadi or Dr. Crum if they have anything to add. If not, if we've covered it, then we will open it up to, uh, to questions at that time, okay? Tammy? Thank you. Um, I need to lower this. There we go. Thank you, Donovan Blackburn. Thank you, Pikeville Medical Center, for allowing public health to bring their perspective uh, for a very serious reason that we're gathered today. So I'm just going to uh, not waste any time and get into the information. My purpose today is to share the current numbers um, from a Pike County uh, perspective. So these are Pike County, Kentucky numbers only, uh, coming from the public health, Pike County Health Department. So just to go over the overall numbers, uh, currently today we've had 7,534 cases reported, uh, 114 deceased, 6,561 recovered, and 859 of those cases are active. That's extremely high number of active cases, and the reason for that is that we're having so many daily cases that it's surpassing the number recovered um, for that 10 to 20 day period depending on the severity of the case. So let's look at the daily incident rate. We'll start there, the daily rate. We look at this as a rolling seven day um, average. And you can see these numbers go through the 23rd of August. And we had 510 cases during that seven day period. That gives us a raw daily average of over 72. But when you normalize that data, because across the state and across the country, we want to see how Pike County's doing in comparison to other counties uh, across our state. Jefferson County, a very large, densely populated county. How's Pike County doing in comparison to Jefferson County? Well, if you normalize that data to how many cases would occur per 100,000, then you can compare how we're doing to other counties. And uh, currently, not so great. Um, the daily incident rate is 125.9. That means we're getting an average per 100,000 citizens, if we had that many, of 125.9 per day. And to put this in uh, perspective, uh, at a national level, public health experts say that any um, caseload at 25 or greater is an overwhelming burden for public health. In other words, we would be unable to maintain full contact tracing and disease investigation beyond 25 cases per day and we are well beyond that, and we've been well beyond that uh, for a couple of weeks now. Looking at the next slide, which is showing the weekly caseload from the beginning of the pandemic to, to today, um, this past um, week, you can see that we've had two significant waves. Uh, there's been a couple of minor ones that occurred back in the summer that mostly we mitigated and protected the community. Uh, the winter, I think everyone's aware that Pike County experienced um, a surge in the winter that we saw a peak 
uh, the week that ended January 10th with uh, 481 cases. We had our highest um, daily number of cases uh, during that surge on January 7th. We had 92 cases on that day. So, and then what we saw was it plateaued and then it came down and uh, that you can see where it plateaued during the summer. But back in July, you can see the second escalation. We are just now beginning the second escalation and we're not seeing uh, these numbers slowing by no means. So we have already surpassed the previous uh, peak in January 2021, this past uh, seven days with uh, 501 cases when I looked at Monday through Sunday, which ended on August 22nd. So every Monday morning, I look at that seven day snapshot and I graph it. I'm always looking at the seven day rolling average, but I place on the graph the Monday through Sunday on Monday mornings. So we had 501 cases on Monday morning, looking at Monday through Sunday. And you can see what I think is very notable here is that the, the escalation that occurred back in the fall leading into winter took 15 weeks to reach that peak. I do not believe we've reached our peak yet, but we have surpassed the winter peak in six weeks, which really is um, a very clear uh, indication of what we've been talking about with the Delta variant that it's moving to two and a half times faster. And you can see this clearly indicates that two and a half times um, acceleration. On the next slide, you'll see the monthly caseload. Um, you can see that January we had 1,523 cases. That was the winter surge peak. And we've already seen 1,298 cases on this um, map. Now, I know yesterday we had 91 cases. It's not including 91 cases from yesterday. And we're seeing 90 to 100 or 100 plus cases per day. And it's not seeming to slow. So we will inevitably uh, surpass January in August. This slide shows, this is simply looking at the previous seven day new cases as they're reported to the Pike County Public Health Department. And we've seen 392 cases for unvaccinated and 118 for the vaccinated. And this is sort of holds true for what we've seen um, since uh, mid to late January when we first started seeing vac uh, some breakthrough cases is that we have had uh, about 20, 23% of the um, vaccinated uh, show positive for COVID, but those cases have overwhelmingly been milder. And, um, and then also, and I'm gonna show on the next slide, which really makes my case as far as um, the vaccinated breakthrough cases uh, were much, are much milder, and we're just not seeing the dis severe disease state in those individuals. Um, I started this graph on January 21st because that's when we had the first documented breakthrough case in Pike County reported to us. And um, so we started with January 21st and we went through August 24th and ran the numbers. And you can see we've had 2,899 cases reported to Pike County Public Health. 2,570 of those cases were unvaccinated. 329 were vaccinated. That's a little over 10% for the vaccinated and, uh, and close to 90% for unvaccinated. Let's look at the hospitalizations. So that tells us who was getting really sick, how many of them were getting sick enough that they required hospitalization. Out of 232 hospitalizations that have occurred since January 21st, 211 were unvaccinated, 21 vaccinated. It's about 10%. 90% were unvaccinated. Okay, as far as confirmation for the deceased, our county has um, had a burden of 20 lost residents since January 21st. And of those 20 Pike County residents that we've lost to COVID-19, all 20 documented reported to the public health today were unvaccinated. So it's very alarming and supports the data when the health department and medical leaders uh, in our county and at Pikeville Medical Center are trying to communicate to the public that the unvaccinated are getting sicker, the, the vaccinated are having milder cases, the data and the statistics clearly support uh, these uh, assertions. Um, I just wanted to briefly go over the red zone recommendations and I'll conclude. Uh, the public health has made, I've made public the red zone recommendations. 
These red zone reduction recommendations are simply best practices or suggestions that come from public health. These aren't mandates um, or guidance that's coming from like, executive orders. These are best practices for how we can get our numbers uh, reduced as quickly as possible. So I wanted to just summarize those um, briefly. So number one, we want to increase vaccination efforts. And I think everyone in this room that's physically here today is giving 110% uh, trying to communicate to the public, to implore the public that you know, increasing our vaccination efforts is our number one approach to reducing our numbers. Um, but also, in order to reduce our numbers as quickly as possible while individuals do step up and seek vaccination that are currently unvaccinated, we encourage the public to mask, to mask while in public indoors specifically, regardless of vaccination status, so that we can protect one another until we get our vaccination percentage rates increased. And in order to weather this surge and make the least impact on our health care community as we possibly can, we need to protect our health care community who's completely uh, overwhelmed as well as public health currently. We also want to encourage the medically vulnerable. These are the immunocompromised, about 3% of our population needs to avoid social activities with uh, potentially with a large crowd or other unvaccinated persons. Um, also for the community, we might want to consider postponing large, this is our larger scale public events. And, um, and one of the reasons why we're here today makes the last point, you want to engage community partners and stakeholders to implement, implement a strong communication plan. But well, we've had that in Pike County from the beginning with the task force with uh, Pikeful Medical Center and Dr. Foddy. Um, and all of the community leaders across Pike County, uh, we've had a strong communication plan and that's really our purpose here today is for a clear and concise communication. And I appreciate public health being invited uh, to the conversation. Thank you. Tammy, thank you uh, again for all you're doing and for your partnership. We greatly appreciate it. Now, folks, uh, the seriousness of this uh, is our, why we decided to have this press conference. As I mentioned on the onset, is that though we've had several members of the media reach out, it would have been very simple just to simply answer those questions. But uh, this is uh, bigger than that. And, and why it's bigger than that is because of the situation that we find ourselves in as a regional hospital. The number of patients that we are seeing come through uh, is absolutely not only overwhelming but concerning and there is certainly consequences to not following the guidelines that Tammy just put up and we'll kind of explain what we're seeing here at PMC also understand that though that we're sharing Pike County numbers because they're easily accessible to us that this same story is being played out all throughout the region you know just before or this morning as I was coming over looking at uh, some of the numbers that were being posted by other agencies look just like Pike County's. When you look at the state, and you'll see that in a minute, that uh, it, it definitely echoes the concern county after county, community after community. People need to take this serious, very serious. So if you'll bear with me just a moment, um, you know, one of the things as we get into numbers, uh, you can't argue with, with, uh, with numbers, with science and with, with data. And that's what we're trying to do today is to take all the politics out of it, all the social media out of it, all the, the false numbers out of there and talk about hard facts and numbers. But as we're talking about numbers today, a few things should resonate. And one is that though we look at the number of positive cases that we see, we have to also recognize that testing is not as prevalent as it was last year. We had testing lines open where anybody could come in and test and what we're seeing now are people with more symptoms or exposure coming in. So there's still a large segment of our population that is more than likely not testing nor reflected in these numbers. This is very, very concerning. Let's talk about a little about Kentucky and a little about Pikeville Medical Center to put this all in perspective. This is a, uh, a map or a PowerPoint that actually I shared with several of our staff members a couple of weeks ago. I've updated it to reflect uh, numbers as of today. So when you look at the state of Kentucky, you go back to on 628. Uh, this was what we looked like back <clears throat> in June. 
<clears throat> also in June, how that correlates with our discussion today, about the same time, we had three, three COVID patients in the hospital. Two were in the ward, and only one was in ICU at the time. Only three. The map looked different then. How we were interacting was different then compared to what it looks like today, which is every single county but one as of yesterday in the red. This is very concerning. And Tammy, I stole some slides from you as well. So uh, again, Tammy, uh, her slides show pretty much the same thing, but if you put it in perspective, and the reason I wanted to show the peak is if you look back again in January and compare it to the exponential growth that we have seen in just a few weeks, what's, what's happening is this is overtaxing our hospital and our providers within the community. And I'm gonna ask, uh, I know there'll be questions in a little bit, and I'll ask Dr. Crum and Dr. Fadi to really address those issues more so. So as of August, again, 24th, 859 cases. But let's look a, at where we're at. And I track, uh, like a lot of us do, uh, data. And if you go back all the way to 12-8 uh, last year, 1-4, you can see the differential all the way up to 823 of how many positive we had per week. And if you go back all the way to February, January last year, the biggest week that we had in differential of positive was a 473 compared to last week of 489. And if you go back again, just four weeks ago, we were at 79. This is alarming. It's concerning. And it's having impact on those who are not only the first line of defense when you're sick, but it's your last line of defense now. We're going to read this backwards because this is how the data comes in. So if you look on the far right-hand side, this is a positive uh, PMC COVID patients uh, as of today, 825. So if you go back on 2020, you can see the growth, the little peaks and valleys. You look today, our peak last year, back in November, uh, we had 82 patients, but again, it took a while to get there. And those patients came from many different hospitals throughout the region. This morning, we find ourselves at 74, and actually I just got a new report as I came over that it increased by two additional patients. So we're at 76 in a much, much shorter time. This has taken a tremendous amount of resources at a time to where healthcare systems throughout the entire country sees a major shortfall in staffing. So we, didn't, we don't have the staff that we had a year ago. We have less staff, we have patients who are sicker, that have to be cared for, and we see this amazing exponential growth in such a very short period of time. The slide here is this year versus back, at, I mentioned in November. November the uh, 15th was actually our biggest census day, but it pulled November the 15th uh, of last year. And if you'll notice on the right-hand side of the black line, all those high areas highlighted in yellow are patients that came from other hospitals. If you'll notice on the left-hand side now, all the patients that we have in the hospital as of yesterday except for one were patients that walked into the hospital from our emergency department. And why this is important is because our emergency department, like so many other hospitals throughout the state and nation right now, are overburdened, are, are unable to accept transfers in as we had once been able to do before. We have hospitals calling from places like Macon, Georgia, looking for bed space to transfer COVID patients into an ICU. This should be alarming. When we look again at today, this slide's a little busy, but let me explain because it's very important. Tammy alluded to it a moment ago, but on 825, as I said, we have 74, but that increased by two. That's not reflective in this, uh, in this slide. We have 59 total patients in our COVID ward and 15 patients in our ICU. If you look at the very top where it says 825 and you look at the very bottom, it says 622. If you go all the way over to the right-hand line, as I said, we had three patients in the hospital on 622. You come forward to 825 this morning, you'll see that we have 74, again, really 76. You look over on the left-hand side, we've got 59 patients in our ward. And again, what you have to be careful of is there's a lot of patients that are coming through that are testing positive that don't have to stay in the hospital. They're able to go home. 
So again, the percentages of those that are positive are much higher uh, from the standpoint of being unvaccinated versus those who are vaccinated. But out of the 59 patients, 13 patients in the hospital right now are breakthrough patients. But let's look at the ICU, those that are getting sicker, those that have to transfer over that are on ventilators or ECMO or struggling for life. This isn't political. It doesn't matter what party these folks are in. I guarantee you all 15 patients, along with the 59 patients, because we've heard the story time and time and time again, that said that we wish we would have got our vaccine. We may have not have been in this position. 15 patients, only one of the 15 is a breakthrough. You're going to hear this time and time again. The vaccine is safe, it's effective, and it works. Again, you can look at the exponential growth going all the way back from 622 all the way up to 825, from 3 to 5 to 15, 17, 22, and all of a sudden, the first of this month, we saw this huge growth. We look at the age group of patients this year compared to last year. This is a chart. Our youngest patient right now is 20. We have 20, 21, 26, 27, 31, 31, 35. These are younger patients as well. No one is immune. We are seeing more pediatric patients as well. This is a slide that was shared by the governor yesterday, or the day before yesterday. Last August, 11.8%. This August, 20.6%. With school back in now, and there's a huge debate going on about masking, and folks, masking work. All you have to do is look last year at what happened with our flu season. We had none. Why? People wore masks. They wore their hands. They social distanced. They did the things that the experts are telling us to do to keep people from getting sick. We have kids going back to school, and I know it's an inconvenience. I have a little granddaughter and a grandson that started school this week, this past week. It's not easy. But our intent is to keep them safe. Those kids are also coming home to grandparents, to moms and dads, who may not be vaccinated and who may be the one that ends up in our hospital. This is a statistic, again, that we're putting out every day as well as our partners, ARH. ARH shows, this is from yesterday, seven vaccinated out of 148 in their system. You can look at over at our statistic as well as 80%. Almost 80% of those that's in the hospital are un, fully unvaccinated. It's hard to argue with science and data, in fact. We talk about masking. There's been a debate that's going on. We're, folks, our people are tired. Our healthcare providers have worked long hours, extra shifts, trying to take care of this community. They're tired. But every day they come in and they put a mask on from the time they walk in this facility until the time that they go home to protect you. We're simply asking for the same consideration because statistically the data shows that it works. It's about, as a Christian organization, which is who we say that we are, and a community. We do this for humility. We do this for kindness. We do it for community. We cannot overburden our healthcare providers or what we're going to find is people being not only denied in, but possibly overwhelming us to the point to where you can't stay home for care. We want to prevent that. Vaccines work, there's no doubt. The same process that was recently followed is also responsible for vaccinating and defeating several. The FDA this week approved the first COVID-19 uh, vaccine, which is Pfizer. Pfizer is pretty much what we offer and it's been the dominant vaccine since the inception. We have done some Moderna, but overwhelming what we have now and what we will continue to offer is Pfizer. Currently, you can receive your vaccine over at our pharmacy. There are many places in our community, about every pharmacy, the health department, Pipo Medical Center, our pharmacy, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. with no appointment necessary. You or your family can simply walk in and get the vaccine. It's real simple. If we want to defeat, if we want to protect our families, if we want to protect our health care network, wash your hands, get vaccinated, wear your mask, and social distance. 
This is coming from the experts in the field, which we'll hear in just a moment. We still have concerns, and when we talk about overburdening our health care uh, hospital, we've had several times where what, what we are seeing is peak, is surge peaks. So Sunday was a good example, is that all of a sudden people wake up and they feel like that they, whether it's hay fever, whether it's cold, or whether they have a fever, whether they're, they're aching, everybody comes to the ER at one time, a lot of them to get tested. It's backing up our ER, it's delaying care, and it's concerning to our staff. Together we, our motto is, is together we rise. I've told our staff together we will get through this, but it's gonna take us all. It's gonna, it's gonna take getting rid of the social media misfacts, to take the politics out of it, and to come together as a community to help defeat this and protect those that we care for and we love because where we're heading right now is very alarming as the region's largest, single largest healthcare provider. I'm gonna ask Dr. Fahey or Dr. Crum if you have anything else you wanna add. Thanks Donovan, thank you guys for being here. I was um, <clears throat> telling Donovan I didn't have anything to add earlier but as I've listened, uh, there's just a few things and the, the, the telling slide or the telling part of the presentation today is the rate of rise of this Delta variant. And so, you know, you hear different messaging um, over, throughout the whole pandemic. You've heard different messaging on what we should do and, and how to uh, get control of it. The Delta variant changed all of that messaging and those slides very well represent what's happening. And we're probably at least three weeks away from the peak. So what you have to understand is, is that right now, um, all of the health systems in Kentucky are stressed, and in, in the nation as well, but certainly in Kentucky. Um, uh, there's a large percentage of places that run at their maximum capacity as we're talking right now. And we're, in general, almost always uh, between 85 and 95% capacity. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But that has to do with the infectivity of this Delta variant. And, the, the take home point is this, that no matter what we do, this uh, rate of rise is gonna continue. So we don't expect that there's not gonna be increased demands. And the key take home is, is that how do you affect what happens to the people of the region? And the answer is vaccination. And it really is vaccination. And uh, you know, in conjunction with the other things, masking, distancing, uh, using prudent judgment, um, vaccination is the one thing that will keep people from dying and we've proven it over and over again. So I think that obviously that's the key take home point of why we're here, but I totally do believe that. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and um, uh, say a few more things. When we talk about, when we talk, when we had these talks before, prior to Delta variant, we looked at demands on healthcare. Um, we, we were really looking at the numbers that we knew in the state and of the staffable beds that were there. And those numbers were a lot larger than they are now. And so when we tell you numbers, <clears throat> they change minute by minute um, because we're talking about staffable beds, the ability to actually take care of people the way that we always have. And with the rate of rise of this infection, that's affected daily by healthcare workers that get infected as well. Uh, so this exposure and, and those risks are ex also exponentially rising. And so we can find ourselves in a place where we have difficulty uh, staffing the beds that we have. Just uh, took a few more notes, Donovan, to see where we get. This. So the other thing is, is that it is true that we can find ourselves, you know, one of the great things that we do is as, as a regional referral center, we're very proud of that. And we try to take care of our, our referring hospitals and, and we try to take care of the region. But you know, with this rise, there's a real concern uh, that we'll be uh, not having a place to, to take, to send patients that need a higher level than we can give or the ability to receive patients that need the care that we can give. We just can't physically staff it and do it. So I think that's a tremendous, a tremendous concern for us as well. I'm going to use your slide to make several points as well. And I think, thank you all for being here as well, because this is definitely an important meeting to shed the light on the severity of the situation, the crisis that we're having now with the COVID-19. So I'm going to take the opportunity 
opportunity and talk about several items based on the slides that Donovan already showed you, and they're amazing. And here I want to talk about the paradox of COVID-19. And people are asking me, what's going on? We had nothing, and we are now in red. And I want to explain here in what's called the exponential math. So the Delta variant is extremely contagious and infectious. The old virgins that we had last year, they have what's called transmission rate of 2.2 or somewhere between 2 to 3. In other terms, one person who's infected will infect two or three more, and two or three more will infect four or six, and then we go into exponential increase in the numbers. So the variable over there was two to three. However, the delta has changed the whole equation in the ball game, and now we're talking about an infectivity rate of eight, which means one person will infect eight, and eight will infect 64, and 64 will infect tons of more patients, and then in 10 days, you have over a million people infected. And this is basically what's going on in the United States. We have almost 150,000 cases per day, and our mortality rate is increasing. So here, the only difference between what we're facing now compared to what we had before is the fast increase of the number of infected people. And that's why you see the change and the dynamic change of the color from somewhere between green and yellow all of a sudden to red. So I want even the public to understand that. The other point I want to make here, look at the difference between the curve we had before compared to now. You can see that the up sloping is slow. What you see now, it's a vertical increase. And if everybody was in Dollywood, I will call it a wild ego ride. OK, this is a wild COVID-19 ride. You go straight 90 degrees. But at least over there, you know exactly what's the height before you fall down. With the COVID-19, I don't know exactly what's going to be the height. And this is the most concerning part. So you have a vertical increase, and nobody can predict what's going to be the peak. And if we can know exactly what's going to be the peak, we're going to have influx of patients coming to the hospital. You're increasing the volume of infected people, and simply 80 they're going to do well, 20 they're not going to do well, and every time you're multiplying by 20%. 20% of these infected folks are going to end in the hospital, and this is going to be a problem. This is stretching our infrastructure, not only at PMC, but all hospitals in the state and in the nation very thin. And the problem is, my concern is somebody needs different kind of care, they will not be able to find it. So that's why we need to all be part of the solution and stop the spread. The other thing, basically, I want to talk about that Donovan basically talked about it very well about that slide. 80% of people infected are non-vaccinated in the hospital. But the key here that only one person from the 15 in the ICU is non-vaccinated. And that person is 79 years old, okay, and has some sort of comorbidity. And that person is not yet under mechanical ventilation. This slide is very telling. It's telling the tale that the vaccine is very protective and is doing its job. If everybody predicting that the vaccine is going to clear the virus completely, this is not going to happen. This is not realistic. Okay, the vaccine is doing its job by cutting down on the severity of the illness, making the illness so mild, and preventing coming to the hospital and ending on mechanical ventilation. The vaccine that we have is not what's called a sterilizing vaccine. Sterilizing vaccine, which means stop all the virus from coming to your system. This is not true. It's called preventive vaccine. And it's doing all the jobs needed to be done, cutting down the severity of the illness, cutting down in hospitalization, and preventing ICU admission as well as deaths. It's decreasing the symptomatic infection by five to eight times. It's decreasing hospitalization by 25 folds. And it's decreasing, basically, deaths by 25 folds. And that's what we need the vaccine to do. And the problem now, you, you see the decline in the efficacy of the vaccine for several reasons. With time, we're going to wane our immunity. And this is normal, especially for older folks, people having immune problems. So with time, we're going to lose that kind of antibody that will do the trick, or we call them the fighters, to be able to stop the infection from occurring. And this is something normal, and that's what we're pushing now for the booster for especially the immunocompromised people. And at a certain point in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the third shot as well to boost what's called neutralizing fighters or antibodies to be able to neutralize that variant from causing harm and damage to our system. So that's basically what I want to talk, and I want to talk as well about the kids as well. So yeah, in the past, we didn't have that problem because I talked to Donovan before about 
I would take that analogy. On a rainy day, you don't get wet if you stay home, correct? And this is what happened last year. We sheltered the kids last year at home, and nothing happened to them. On the top of that, we were pushing for mitigation measures. Look what happened today, 20%, and I can tell you that number even bigger than that. These kids are involved in more activities, mainly physical activities, and we are loosing on, on the brakes. We're not basically putting brakes on, on, on mitigation measures. So we are basically doing a lot of activities without masking, especially for unvaccinated. And why the problem here? Because majority of kids in school are unvaccinated. The vaccine is emergently used, authorized for 12 and older and not yet for 12 and younger. So you have a big proportion of kids in school, they have no vaccine and this is becoming a problem because I believe in the next few weeks, these kids will be the main drivers of that kind of infection. They're gonna have more infection, they're gonna spread it more. And these folks, they have elderly at home. And we can, see, we can say clearly that big proportion of these kids, they have grandparents taking care of them. And if these grandparents, they cannot take, they're not vaccinated, they may suffer the bad outcome of the vaccine. So the bottom line, to be able to achieve what's called immunity level, we need to achieve herd immunity. And now with the Delta variant, the equation is a little bit different. So all the 50% vaccinated, but we still have big chunk of people not vaccinated. To be able to build that immune wall and stop the spread, we need to go 70, 75, and 80%. Without doing this, we're gonna see a lot of cases basically circulating. And we're gonna see a lot of complication lagging beyond today. Today is 76, tomorrow it could be more than that. And next week even could be worse. So we need to think about it and we need to make the right decisions for our community and vaccination definitely one of the best tools we have now in our arsenal. And probably in my opinion, it's gonna be the only path to normalcy. I'm gonna stop. Okay, Dr. Fadi, thank you. I would uh, ask uh, Dr. Fadi, if you don't mind, and Dr. Crum, come on up here and kind of space out. I wanna be can kind of stand close by one at the podium. Tammy, if you don't mind as well. And uh, what we like to do at this time, and we'll, uh, we'll step aside if the question uh, goes to, to one of our colleagues here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and open it up for questions at this time. assessing that right now so what you heard me say earlier is is that there is this national crisis uh, with uh, providers in general with folks in our field regardless of what they're doing uh, you know we're short on everything from phlebotomists to technicians to housekeepers and I could go right on down the line uh, because of the surge the governor Dr. Stack actually reached out week before last and said that they were looking at this as a plan asking if we uh, could use the help? And the answer was really quick and really simple, and it was yes. So we have our chief nursing officer right now, uh, Michelle Rainey, who is talking uh, to Frankfurt as up to as uh, they are deployed, how we will be able to use them. It will probably be uh, more than likely the initial phase will not be provider based. These will be folks that will be doing things like transport. Um, helping uh, maybe even with housekeeping from that standpoint, but they were open to coming in and trying to help us continue to fill a void. Uh, as of, I think, last week, and I don't have a number that's really accurate, but I'll get close, but we have close to 200 job openings at Pikeville Medical Center right now. That same story is being told all across the state. It's not just here, it's everywhere. Uh, the demand that this pandemic has put upon hospitals and other providers, and then you have other factors that you're dealing with also, that you, ha you had you know, the average RN right now is about 51 years of age uh, who just lived, who's worked 20, 30 years in this industry and has just lived through one of the toughest times of their life. So they're retiring at, at early, earlier ages and, and uh, getting out of this uh, profession. Uh, you've got uh, areas that, you know, have higher infection rate uh, in more metropolitan areas that agencies have came in to recruit uh, folks to those areas as well. So a lot of rural communities especially, uh, not that it's not only in rural communities, it's pretty much everywhere 
and any uh, administrator that you talk to. So in working with uh, the governor and uh, Dr. Stack, uh, we've, there's about a three-tier plan that they've laid out to try to at least help fill some of those voids. Because if we can free somebody up that's transporting someone, then that allows us to use that person for another need. Uh, but we're looking at, obviously, right now with the National Guard deployment and them coming in uh, next week. And then uh, also they're working on a FEMA uh, request to hopefully get additional providers into the state, at which uh, PMC, because of all these statistics and numbers that we're talking about, and uh, we're, we're, us along with about five or six other hospitals are being considered for that help. You know, the difference uh, why Pikeville Medical Center is that it's our size, we're a regional provider, we take care of sicker patients. Uh, the network needs to be here to be able to take care of this part of the state. And then actually the governor uh, personally called me yesterday um, as well. And there's a third uh, piece that uh, I'll leave it to him to announce uh, if they can work it out that will give us some additional personnel. Uh, beyond that, we also have uh, plans that Dr. Crum and his team has put into place that uh, will allow us that as um, a surge continues that we may reallocate uh, our, our resources uh, to different parts of the hospital that need them. So we do have an internal plan uh, to be able to handle different situations. However, the, the concern is if you look at the exponential growth and you look at the track, if this does continue for three, six weeks or longer, the rate, the growth, the wraith growth is going to be of such magnitude that we're afraid that we're not going to be able to overcome completely. So it does stop the transfers in. It does stop possibly um, the rest transferring people out that need a higher level of care because we don't have an ICU bed available. Uh, and that's what we're really here today to try to get people to understand. You know, I'm, I'm kind of going on another tangent, but imagine waking up two weeks from now and looking at your spouse or your grandfather or your grandmother and taking them to the hospital because they had COVID to be told that we're overwhelmed, that we don't, have, we don't have an ICU bed. And that person may end up a county away, they may end up five counties away, they may end up a state away during one of the most difficult times of their life. This is what we're trying to prevent and this is why the vaccine is so important is though there's a lot of uh, you know, comments and things that we see on social media that we really try not to pay attention to but it's hard at times and we have to set the record straight because the fact of the matter is when you look at the statistics, you cannot deny that the vaccine has impact. Yes, there are breakthroughs and yes, you may be able to get it, but your chances of dying, 6,000, a little over 6,000 people in the entire U.S., 0.0019%, I think was the statistic that we shared. So the National Guard coming in, FEMA coming in, all these different pieces coming in will allow us to protect the infrastructure, but our message is that it cannot just be on the shoulders of government. It cannot be just on the shoulders of the people that are standing in this hospital today because we have been doing it for the last year and a half. We're asking for the community to, to listen to the data, to listen to the science, and to please consider doing what we feel like is the right thing, to protect our community, protect those that are most vulnerable, protect our kids, and to protect our healthcare network. It's important now more than it ever has been during this pandemic. Thank you. Hello. Uh, following the uh, FDA's approval of the Pfizer vaccine, does the hospital plan to introduce or enforce any type of vaccine mandate? I don't care if you can. The, the answer to that is yes. Um, we along with um, more than 11 now, but at least initially 11 of the biggest healthcare organizations in Kentucky that represented the majority of, of beds in Kentucky and employees in Kentucky all um, jointly agreed to do a vaccination mandate. And we did that because it was the right thing to do medically. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's, it's unbelievably important um, and it's, uh, it, it sends the right message to people, but the, you know, these things get misinterpreted sometimes, and I think that that comes out because, <clears throat> you know, we announce those in the most public way to announce them, which is by the governor. And uh, then, you know, it can appear to be political, but that was absolutely a non-political decision that was made by the healthcare leaders of the state. So the answer is yes, we, we are mandating vaccinations. 
And I'll add that, uh, to Dr. Crump's point, this isn't political. The governor has a platform. A lot of people watch. Our intent as all these healthcare systems who represent over 75% of the beds in Kentucky, along with KHA, we band together to say that we have to protect the infrastructure of those that are going to depend upon us, that are our employees as well. And what we're seeing now is, we mentioned earlier, is a significant amount of our staff coming down with COVID. And we certainly want them to recover. You know, we're proud of our staff, the 3,000 employees that every day have come to this center and have taken care of this community. But this wasn't a decision that was taken lightly. It wasn't a decision that was taken on our own. We've done a lot of things to try to educate our staff, such as a Q&A session. We let all of our staff ask questions. We had a town hall meeting for our staff, which we released publicly, most of it. But we also had endorsements by almost every national and state professional medical organization that says that this is the right thing to do. The Kentucky Hospital Association, Medical Association, the Kentucky Nurses Association, outside of the multiple, multiple, multiple organizations that endorse this. And right now, over 30, I think it's 30 some percent, 32 percent of the hospitals, and some larger healthcare systems in the U.S. have also taken the same measures. A lot of hospitals were waiting until the EUA was, the vaccine was approved uh, formally by the FDA. And we're seeing that happen now, not just with hospitals, but with universities and private businesses across the U.S. You know, it's not just about hospitals. We have to, we have to protect our food chain and, and all the other things that it takes to run this great country to make sure that people can show up and not only can they work and take care of this country, but that we keep them alive. Because every day, again, our staff who I admire beyond words, and I admire our partners, Tammy, for what you all have done. I, our pharmacists in this area, our providers that's in this area that has all stepped up to try to take care of the community. And we've tried to do it in a way to share good information, to leave the politics out of it, and just to simply do what's right. Next question. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, yes. Um, just how frustrating is it that some leaders are not um, pushing people to wear masks? And how do you get leaders to either enforce a mask mandate or just urge them to get vaccinated? You know, it's a difficult question and all, the way I would answer it is, is doing what we're doing today. To take the politics out of it and just do the right thing. You know, we had the opportunity this week or last week actually of reaching out and talking to a couple of the school superintendents and to voice our concern and let them know to bring them as, as partners as part of what's going on. Because people, we have smart people in this region. You educate them, they'll do the right thing. But of course, what we're, we're not only fighting the pandemic, unfortunately, we're, we're fighting sometimes social media, we're fighting politicians, we're fighting the national news at times. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating to me. Uh, you know, look, Dr. Crumb says this all the time, and I appreciate him more than he knows. I, I, I told my board yesterday, this guy's a rock star, as is Dr. Foddy and all of our other staff as well. But, but you know, I, I, I served in politics for almost 14 years before I came to the hospital. I'm polished. I know how to give you an answer. And what I'm telling you today is I'm not, this isn't about politics. This is about preservation of human life, about doing the right things. Look at the statistics. Take the politics out of it. And let's just do the right thing. Thank you for the question. Hi. Um, sorry. Um, I know you like kind of addressed this, but I want to ask you directly about transfers and whether you're able to receive new patients from like Macon, Georgia. And then is there also, I know you guys, there's some patients that you just can't help them. Are you able to transfer them out? for that additional help? Actually, and that's a great question, and the answer depends upon the specific moment in time, and, and that's really where we're at right now. And so, you know, our hospital is pretty stretched in a lot of areas, so in the, we typically here always get stretched in the intensive care unit. Uh, that's even pre-COVID, um, because we're one of the only really high-level ICUs um, in the region. and. Um, but COVID changed that, you, you know, starting last year and much more, I think, now. So our, our ICU is definitely um, kind of at its limits. It also, you've got to realize that when we staff an ICU, 
the number of nurses that are required to take care of those patients is different. Uh, so, you know, a COVID patient requires more staff in general than a regular patient, or at least we provide more staff for them. And then the ICUs are either have one or two nurses per patient. So it's a tremendous resource utilization to do that. But we certainly, um, you know, um, we certainly accept transfers if, if the patient can benefit from us and we have the ability to do that. Um, and then we also will look to seek to transfer patients out if we think that they need a higher level of care. The problem is, is that, you know, at this moment, that's a little bit of a battle. It's an everyday thing. And it's, uh, you know, we have our nursing uh, staff and our, our hospital staff that are able to move things around and they respond to these small and incremental changes. But if you, if you go back to Dr. Foddy's discussion point, you know, we know probably three weeks will be the peak, but what will the number of that be? And will it really be three weeks? I don't think we know. But that projection is difficult because, you know, uh, the major universities are close to full right now, and we're close to full right now. It, it, it really puts you in a, in, a, in, a, in a scary situation. Can I add one thing? Yeah, yeah. I want to add one thing here. So last year, we did mitigation measures to flatten the curve. We didn't have any options. We had no therapeutics. We had no vaccine. And people, they argue with us, the number will be the same, but you're going to spread it over a long period of time. That situation today has changed drastically. You have a vaccine that will prevent these infections from happening. So that's basically a big game changer. And now with the FDA approval of the Pfizer, all the worries and the anxiety is being taken out. So somebody has worries on the plate should be taken out because we had a body of evidence about the safety of the vaccine, about the efficacy. It's not perfect, but it's doing its job. And now with the, with the access to the vaccine, that situation can be easily changed. We're not only flattening the curve, we're changing the curve. And that's why we keep pushing for the vaccine as a solution for what's going to happen in the next few, few, few weeks or basically in the next few months. I'm Austin Pollock with WLAX in Lexington. We know that obviously because of the, the increase in the high demand, do you worry that anything mobile or any sort of any sort of work outside of the actual physical hospital, you'll need more. Do you worry that what you have right now will not even be enough to handle what could come? You can start. Yeah. I, I think the question was about, do we worry about uh, having available resources to take care of the surge? You know, um, the, we're fortunate here on one side that we have tremendous um, physical uh, capability. So, you know, we have a a lot of beds, we have a lot of areas that can be converted to care areas, we just have a big physical space, and it's all very modern and very new. But yes, we absolutely are concerned about our ability to staff. And you know, um, we're not at any, we're not at a, a crisis point right now, but the reason that we're here is because we're worried that we will be. And you know, uh, when you get to those points where you're having to go through, um, you know, contingency staffing or alternate ways to take care of patients, that's a scary thing. None of us in my whole lifetime have ever had to deal with the thoughts of a contingency staffing or contingency medical care model. And, you know, while we're prepared for that, we're doing everything we can uh, to make that not happen. And, and that, that is the reason to be here imploring people because really, uh, uh, we're all correct, the masking works, uh, social distancing works, all these things are important. But with this uh, infectivity of the Delta variant, it's not gonna be enough. And so people are still gonna get infected and that's vaccinated or not. And the only way that we can decrease the demand on the health systems, in our opinion, is, is vaccination. And I think that we can, and you know, it goes further because here's the problem. This is, going to be a, this is going to be a demand in Kentucky. I can tell you, over the next two or three weeks, you guys are going to see things are going to change in healthcare. We are going to be stressed. Uh, you know, we're mobilizing the National Guard to come and help. That, I've never known that to happen uh, to anything in my healthcare career. So it's very significant. But what happens is, if we don't get uh, this high level of vaccination and immunity, we're just going to be dealing with it again. Uh, and so, you know, back to the vaccination mandates, you say, why do you do that now? 
now's, now's as good a time as any. It's going to come around. And the only way that we can seriously get control of this so it's a manageable, ongoing problem is through vaccination. Hi, I'm Erin Noon with um, Channel 13 in the Charleston Huntington area. Sorry I didn't introduce myself earlier. Um, my question would be for uh, health, for doctors, how heartbreaking is it to have to look at a family member and just tell them that their family member might not even make it um, from COVID and just the emotional toll it could take on a healthcare person in general? I'm actually going to let Dr. Foddy really answer that because he, on a day-to-day -day basis, deals with these patients. But I do want to tell you uh, a conversation that drove home to me where we were at. And this was earlier, uh, and this was from the director of our intensive care units, uh, Dr. Io. And, and what he told me was, and this was when we had the law. Uh, you know, we had had a hard time pre-Delta variant. There was a lull in cases. And he was essentially forcing his doctors to take vacation. These guys work really hard. And, and what he told me was, this is the only time in their lives where people were coming to the intensive care unit and they were dying and they shouldn't be dying. And so in general, those guys know what to do. They know what to expect. Um, and, and they're used to bad things happening. But they were having young people come in, have tremendous demands of, of oxygen and other resources, and they should have been okay and they weren't. And so that's, I think, the overall thing that's going on with our very sick patients. But I'll let Dr. Fadi speak to that more. Again, talking about the importance of the vaccine, in my personal opinion, it's a tragedy to see anybody coming to the hospital because of COVID, and this problem could be easily prevented by a vaccine. Let's put it this way, straightforward. And I know everybody's arguing against the vaccine, but you are comparing a vaccine versus an infection which is totally unpredictable and killing a lot of people while you have a body of evidence telling us that the vaccine is so protective, so safe, and doing its job. So the argument, I really, I don't comprehend the argument why we are arguing vaccine versus COVID when mortality is extremely high in the COVID population and probably unheard in the vaccine population. So the vaccine is extremely effective, it's safe, there's not going to be any problem with it because we know from all the studies we've done, it's so protective and so safe. And if you go to the CDC website, these serious adverse events are extremely rare. They're not common. They're of seldom occurrence. So I believe now with the FDA approval, I think this is going to be a, its milestone currently in the, the battle of COVID-19 because this is going to cut down on the pressure and the anxiety for a lot of people. And this probably will give them an incentive to get the vaccine because currently it's licensed, it's fully licensed. This is not an AUA or emergency use authorized medication anymore. This is a fully licensed medication and that safety has been completely ascertained and the effectiveness has been completely ascertained. So currently we have an FDA approved medication. It's way better than the flu if you talk about the effectiveness. Base case scenario you get from the flu vaccine is 70%. You have a vaccine achieving 95% is gonna wane down the road, but this is totally normal. This is our body. Our body will lose antibodies or fighters with time. So I believe the vaccine is absolutely pivotal and crucial, especially during this period. And again, not only to flatten the curve, to prevent that curve completely. There is tons of psychological burden on people coming to the hospital. And I said that several times ago. The acuity of care that we've seen now is extremely unprecedented. We see young people coming to the hospital and that's a problem with COVID-19, it's so unpredictable. And for me, I cannot tell who's, who's the one's gonna end in the ICU or who's the one who's gonna leave the hospital or even not having any symptoms. So it's still a lot of unknown about the COVID-19, but the fact is vaccine can decrease the severity of the disease, prevent hospitalization, prevent death, and protect the community at large. Thank you. Just uh, as while you're still there, just again tell me, as a physician and as a doctor, how emotional it is for you uh, personally, not just the people um, coming in, but how you have to talk to these families and see these situations um, hand, like firsthand. Th this has been an extremely emotional year and a half for all of us. And again, here we've seen suffer, we're seeing complications that we never seen before. So this is the first time I feed that kind of amount of infection coming in the hospital to, in one time. And my problem, I have no good medication to help them. 
And the problem as well, I don't know who's the one who's gonna end in the ICU and having complications. So they're very stressful situation, very emotional, very uh, like uh, uh, putting too much pressure on even healthcare workers. The amount of hour you spend in the hospital, the stress from taking care of these patients, the demand from these patients, as Dr. Crum and, and uh, Mr. Blackburn said, we have to allocate all our basically force towards these patients. And this is basically exhausting. So keep in mind that. So these are very sick people. They require a lot, a lot of demand. They require a lot of medical care. And, and this is not easy to do that. Let me add one point to that, to what both Dr. Crum said and to what Dr. Fadi said to a degree, is that if you haven't watched our town hall meeting that's now on social media, the Kentucky Hospital Association received a copy of it and they reposted it for all their uh, social media followers. There is valuable information. And one of the, I won't say turning points and, and because of my perception of what's happening, because I'm not in the ICU as an administrator, but when you listen to Dr. Io describe what he's going through, reality should set in. When he says that I may be the last guy that your spouse or grandparent whose hand they were holding when it was preventable because of the vaccine, possibly preventable because of the vaccine. And when you take it a step further, the frustration is, is that there's a resistance to take the vaccine because of misinformation guided by whatever source, social media and others. I don't want to blame it just on that. But when you look at the Q, when we open it up to the Q&A session, to hear some of the concerns and the questions out there, we had a responsibility to do what we've been doing, to host a Q&A, to host a town hall, to put information out there to share that we're sharing with you today. But if you haven't watched that town hall session, it's a little under an hour long now. We've, we've condensed a little bit to, to make it a little sooner. But these are the directors from almost every department that we have in the largest regional hospital in eastern Kentucky that have not only gone to school for multiple years, but have really focused upon their specialty. Listen to those answers and turn off that stuff that, ha that cannot be validated or substantiated because it's not true. There's a lot of misnomers out there that are costing lives. Our hope is today is to, is to plea, to plea with this community to understand what's going on, to understand where we may be two weeks from now or three weeks from now, but to understand the reality of what's actually happening and what we're doing. You know, one of the most powerful statements that I've, that you've heard when we talk about masking and vaccines is that everybody you see up here right now, we were the first in line to say we're going to take the vaccine because it's the right to do, right thing to do. Every single day, I'll say it time again, I cannot be more proud of those folks that are taking care of this community and our facility because every single day they come in, a lot of them work 12, 14 hours or longer, and they have these things on every single day to protect this community. All we're asking is, is pleading is to look at the fact, look at what's happened with the vaccine, take the vaccine so that hopefully, and, and by God's prayer and, and his great grace, that it's not one of your family members or you that Dr. Io is holding their hand. Thank you, Buddy Forbes, WIMT here. Um, kind of talk to me about some of the internal measures you guys are taking, such as the visitation and the triage tents, and how that looks in an already stretched workforce. Yeah, it, it, it's just a constant um, battle uh, against the situation that's at hand. And so, you know, we have to protect our own workforce. And so in, in doing that, we have universal masking policy that goes throughout our whole organization, not just on the main campus here. So that's been instituted quite some time ago. Um, visitation, you know, that's limited now. We, we put it through stages, but we do have visitors here and in all honesty, um, limited visitation, I think, is a good thing for patients, and it's a good thing for us as providers. Uh, you know, patients do need that, that voice there, and, and so as long as we are able to do that, we try to do that. And so, um, you know, so I do think that's important. The bigger thing, though, is, is, you know, how do you use your resources the most effectively? And there's several things that are going on, and, and it changes day to day. So one would be testing availability. 
we can go through periods of time where we really have a lot of available uh, rapid tests for COVID. We can go through periods of times where we really have to kind of save those for people that are sick um, and that they need to make decisions quickly whether they're going to be admitted or, or if admitted where they're going to go and how they're going to be treated. And so those things vary every few days, to be honest with you. But what we've done is, you know, we want to provide the care in the safest way possible and we want to do the right thing. So we do have the ability to do to decrease the load of patients that actually flow through the emergency room uh, that may have lower acuity. So we have a mechanism to try to, to because, you know, that ER gets full fast and um, it's a very important place, but it, it needs to be for certain patients that, that are likely needing that care. We, we do have the ability to do lower acuity care also here. Uh, we also have multiple clinics throughout the area and throughout the region uh, where we're able to um, take care of those patients as well. We also have a lot of employees. We have over 3,000 employees. And so we have to make sure that we protect the wor workforce with our policies and with our testing there too. So what we've done is um, we've tried to make our workforce, um, we've actually just mobilized their testing uh, for people that screen positive because we do screen all of our employees uh, off-site um, and in a, in a different mechanism. So basically it's a constant battle of what's the best test for the right person at the right moment and what's the best way to mobilize people and preserve our resources. So it is a constant battle. Some of the uh, buddy to that question too, one of the things that Dr. Crum and, and our HR department does frequently is revise our policies as they're needed. So our visitation policy is coded by color. You can see it if you're driving here up on the marquee that will tell you where we're at. We're currently at the one patient uh, or one visitor per patient. There's some other components to that. Our universal masking policy uh, for all of our facilities. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Crum, because I think it's important, you know, one of the most difficult policies that once it's approved that through executive authority that I have to approve is also our ethics policy. Um, you want to briefly describe that as well? Yeah. Why that's important? You know, it's, it's one of those things that you, um, fortunately, we don't really have a lot of ethical uh, dilemmas in the delivery of health care. We occasionally have some ethical issues that come up. But you know, when you're talking about uh, the, the worry that we have and the reason that we're here, it all purely comes down to volume and being able to take care of patients. And it's, uh, you know, so we do have a, a um, uh, I guess a mobile ethics committee, one that we can get together very rapidly and they can make decisions. But you know, the reason that we're doing that is because of, of the prediction of how this surge is gonna continue. Because in all honesty, you've heard us say it, if, if we're full, and we can't take transfers and we can't send people out, then people have nowhere else to go. And so then you become operating in the contingency or crisis staffing modes, because we're gonna take care of people as best we can. But you know, as best you can sometimes makes you have very difficult decisions. Uh, and so with limited resources, and we have tremendous resources, um, but, but there still is limitations to that. Um, you know, sometimes decisions may have to be made uh, that are very hard. And that's what the ethics committee is for, um, is, is, you know, case by case decisions if things were to get a a out of hand. Hi again, this is Liz Mimi with the Lexington Herald Leader. I have two questions and some of it is expanding on Buddy's question about resources. Are you guys, I guess, is there anything else like resources wise that you're worried about having a shortage or currently have a shortage. I know PPE was stretched really thin last year. Um, and then my second question is, with the Delta variant rising, I feel like nationally there's been an increase in vaccination rates and now, I know it's been two days since Pfizer has been uh, FDA approved officially, um, but have you seen an increase in vaccination rates? Thank you. Um, I'll answer a couple pieces and or points to your question, then I'll turn it over to Dr. Crum or Dr. Fadi if they want to respond as well. But from the standpoint of resources, we have a great team, internal team, that every day that's their job is to manage the supplies that we have and to look at our back, uh, what we have in reserve. We have a uh, percentage of supplies that we have specifically for a surge, uh, but that is maintained on a on a day-by-day -day basis. As of right now, there's no major concern. There's a couple of PPE uh, pieces that we've heard that may be an issue, but we're not seeing that as of right now. 
uh, but that is tracked uh, daily. Uh, other resources, you know, and ironically, just standing here uh, during this press conference, and folks, it's not political, but we have other avenues and other options for folks to reach out to when we need assistance, and it's not political. In the last couple of minutes, I've got a uh, voicemail from Congressman Hal Rogers' office. The governor has called me, and Dr. Stack has called me just while we're standing here. And what they're doing is they're checking, asking what resources that we need, both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat because they're concerned about the state of what they see Kentucky and, and where we're at. So there is some, I mentioned earlier, the National Guard and FEMA coming in. There is another resource that, which is why the governor and Dr. Stack is calling me, that has to do with testing that we're hoping to be able to get some additional resources as well. So as soon as the conference is over, I'll be calling both Congressman and uh, Hal Rogers' office back just uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, Senator McConnell's office reached out as well to ask uh, if we were okay and if we needed any assistance from them as well. So, um, and, and as always, our local representatives, whether it's the mayor or, or, or the county judge or, or uh, other politicians that can help move supply chains and help other things happen, um, is also available uh, to us if needed. So it's not, you know, our purpose for coming today was to talk about the severity and to talk about the facts to not talk about the politics, but we have to be realistic to say that we all need each other right now to make sure that we don't get into this trouble that we're talking about. And to plead with the community to, once we disclose what we're talking about, they, they'll understand the severity of what could happen and what is happening at this time. Yeah, I think that's a pretty complete answer. I'll tell you, you know, resources, our concern is in uh, staff resources. It's people resources right now more than more than it is actual physical resources. There are some concerns with certain medications uh, that um, you know may run low uh, over time that they use for COVID treatment. Um, the problem, though, is is that these things change very rapidly. And you know, right now, our, our, I guess testing would be the area where we're kind of week by week looking at how we're going to do our testing here on site. Um, but um, you know, if you triple. Uh, if this slope continues and you triple the admissions in the country over the next three weeks, it doesn't take long before that, what I just told you, becomes, uh, you know, a different story. Other question? Go ahead. I forgot about that answer. Questions, are we seeing our vaccination rate go up? Um, I can only speak on behalf of, of uh, PMC, and the answer is yes. Over the last few weeks, we have seen a, an uptick. Uh, is it where it needs to be? Absolutely not. Uh, that's why that we're here today. So what we've seen, you know, just being very candid, is, is uh, probably six weeks ago, we had an average of probably uh, 15 to 20 vaccinations a day. Uh, now that ranges, depending upon the day, anywhere between uh, 100 to 120. Uh, so, um, and likewise, obviously with a a policy that we have internally with our staff, we're also seeing part of that is, is our staff, those that haven't been vaccinated. Now, I've been very proud, and I've said this over the past couple of weeks, we've seen a substantial, once we announced our policy, and a substantial take rate uh, by those that had not uh, taken it uh, here at, uh, as part of our staff. We're trying to make it easy for them as well. So Monday through Friday, for example, if from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, here actually on the first floor, uh, we have a, uh, a vaccination clinic just for our staff. As I mentioned, we take now walk-ins from our pharmacy across the street, the outpatient pharmacy, but that shouldn't prevent anybody uh, from, from moving forward because, again, the health department, all the pharmacists in the area, there's providers in the area, uh, there's somebody out there that can easily take it. And I've heard uh, Dr. Fadi say this several times, you know, they do no good in the fridge. We need to get them out of the fridge in the arm. Uh, it's really easy to take them out of the fridge right now. We have ample supply. Hearing nothing, uh, Tammy, I know most of the questions have been directed at the hospital, but I'd like to give you a, a moment or two to, for any final words as well. I'll probably use this time, and I'll be very brief, just to expand maybe on the vaccination rate question, uh, talking about Pike County, for example. Uh, we are definitely, as Mr. Blackburn mentioned, uh, countywide, we're seeing an uptick uh, in number of vaccinations, first, second, and also that third dose that was recently um, released. But in the county, we are at 45.3%. Those are the documented 
through the Kentucky Immunization Registry. I, I know that number is uh, likely higher, uh, maybe closer to 50 percent, but we have to wait for some of the uh, pharmacies and outlying uh, providers to get their data. So it's a little bit slow um, uptake in the information, but I know we're at 45.3 percent. That represents 26,205 Pike County residents. I would like to point out that when you look at the, the most vulnerable, 65 and older, at the state level, they have an 85% vaccination participation rate. And we have is 68, I believe, um, percent, 68.3%. So we need um, all age demographics. We're seeing it was a very low number for that 12 to 15 year age that for that expanded emergency use authorization for Pfizer. Uh, now that school's going back and we are seeing about 33% currently in Pike County, uh, 18 years of age and, and, and younger in the past seven days, it's been about 33% infection rate in school age children. So with that, with that increase, um, I do believe it's gotten some parents' attention and also the, the Pfizer uh, full approval also helped, but we're seeing an increase in the 12 to 15 year age as well. But overall, uh, the state has us at 42%. Locally, I know at the, I have confirmed 45.3%. I suspect we're around 50%. But all age demographics, we need to see that number uh, increase. And if you're an employer out there, you know, give an employee a day off or give some kind of perk. Find some way, uh, you know, to, to make it easier. And when you do that, back up and do it for the ones who already stepped forward and vaccinated uh, prior to any incentive. But, you know, help your em employees, you know, help you and help them make uh, a good decision for themselves, their family and their community. Can I add something on that? So even if we take the best case scenario, 50%, this is not enough to have what's called immunity level for the community. And again, going back to the point, people with weak immunity and older, they started receiving the vaccine very early. And these folks, sometimes they cannot mount immunity. So what's the situation here? Sometimes these people are totally dependent on us to be immune to protect them. So two points here. Number one, we need definitely to increase the level of immunity by getting more vaccination, and we need to get quickly to the herd immunity and preferably by vaccine. So 50% is not gonna do the trick. We need 70 and more, and preferably even 80% to be able to move like to the finish line and try to turn this awful chapter. And to uh, add to two points, to put it in perspective, one is, is even if we're doing 100 a day, um, and that's good, just here at PMC, back when we had the vaccine line open, our biggest day was about 1,200 in a day. So it is substantially less than where we were, still at only 50%, which means, again, we're only, if we're at 50% or close to, it's halfway, there should be a surge now, uh, folks coming out because of the Delta and what's happening. Uh, and then I 100% agree with Tammy. You know, we appreciate, uh, we've, we've tried to show our healthcare workers here our appreciation with uh, heroes bonuses. We've, uh, we've author, also offered special incentive pay for those patients that are, or employees that are working directly with COVID patients. Uh, currently, we have, we just gave away uh, two $3,000 prizes, two uh, 2002, I'm sorry, three, Three thousand, three, two thousand, three, one thousand dollar prizes for any employee who uh, received their vaccine, or uh, if if uh, if they had a. I'm trying to think of the word. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, exemptions was a word. Sometimes it just don't come. Um, and then we have an ongoing between uh, now and September the fifteenth. Uh, those same employees and anyone new can also uh, register to win two additional $3,000 prizes, two additional $2,000, two additional $1,000. Um, we're trying to throw every resource we can behind it, not only to educate our own staff um, so that they can educate others. A lot of people, when you walk in uh, a grocery store or a chain, they see Pipeline Medical Center badges, uh, they ask questions. And we're trying to help educate not only why you should take the vaccine, but also educate them enough where they can give the same type of answers that we're giving uh, here today. So we certainly hope that uh, today's uh, session has been helpful. Our really intent is not to criticize folks. I know, you know, it, it amazes me. I was telling Dr. Crum this when we got on. No matter what we put on social media, we see the mad faces and the thumbs down. 
you know, these are people again, and I take up for them, that's my job. These are people for the last year and a half have put themselves on the line every single day and have worn these masks and they haven't complained. And to be ridiculed in a way of just giving data and facts, even though it's a different maybe mindset, um, you know, they don't deserve it. And I'm going to stand up for them every single time. If you want to be mad at somebody, be mad at me. Uh, not the folk that's taking care of you when you come into the ED or you're going into the ICU or when you're in a COVID or when you're taking blood or you're getting your vaccine. They're doing their job and they're doing it well. And all we're trying to do is to educate the public and to say, do your part as well. Look at the facts, look at the statistics, look at, look at the data and help us, help us help each other. I appreciate everybody coming out today and I uh, appreciate the questions. And as always, if anybody has anything past this part, if you'll reach out to our uh, PR department, they'll be happy to uh, get you the additional information. Thanks everybody for coming today.